Hi, everyone, and welcome to the next conversation in our new model series, which invites practitioners from different disciplines to discuss how their work can change the models around which society is organized. Each talk addresses how we can shift power structures, socioeconomic forces, and structural inequalities present in society today to give us new tools to rethink the world around us. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Manisha Verghese. I'm the head of the AA's public program, and I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speakers who through their unique forms of practice are striving to change the status quo. Thomas J. Price is an artist based in London. His work across media encompassing sculpture, film, and photography is engaged with issues of representation and perception in society and in art. Since 2005, Price has been making figurative sculptures, which function as psychological portraits of his imagined subjects, usually male and usually black. Price plays with methods of presentation, material, scale, and detail in order to challenge viewers' ex expectations and assumptions. His work has been exhibited across the UK and Canada with forthcoming installations in London, Montreal, Milwaukee, and New York. He was also recently commissioned to create one of the first permanent public sculptures to honor the Windrush generation outside Hackney Town Hall. And this year, his first individual full figure representation of a woman reaching out was installed as part of London's public art walk, The Line, as one of very few public sculptures of a black woman in the UK. Joining him is Michael Prokopov, an, 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 sorry, a historian and curator. His areas of expertise include material culture, design and architecture, cultural theory and curatorial practice. He has published widely on aesthetics, craft and modernism. In 2016, he published a study of a landmark house designed by Canadian architect Arthur Erickson for Vancouver artists Gordon and Marion Smith. And he co-curated the critically acclaimed traveling exhibition, True Nordic, How Scandinavia Influenced Design in Canada. He's currently working on a book on the British artist, Herven Anderson, and a study of the contemporary residential architecture in British Columbia. He divides his time between London and Toronto, where he's a faculty member at OCAD University and he holds a PhD from Harvard University. So tonight they'll present a new model for public art, discussing Price's career to date and his focus on figurative sculptures that celebrate the anonymous or everyday citizen. Recent events, including the toppling of Edward Colston's statue in Br Bristol and its short-lived replacement by Mark Quinn's figurative depiction of Jen Reed, have provoked the question of who gets to author these new works, as well as what we gain by replacing one statue for another. Tonight's conversation asks how we can move beyond recognizing individual achievements to instead empower new and multiple voices through our public art that celebrates who we are as a society today. So on that note, I'd like to welcome both Tom and Michael to the AA, albeit in this virtual setting. They'll be in conversation for around 45 minutes to an hour and then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Um, if you have a question while they're in conversation, um, please just either use the raise hand function um, in the participants tab um, or post it in the chat and I can ask it on your behalf. Um, and also if you don't mind turning on your camera, that would be great so that they don't feel like they're speaking into a void. But that's just a request if you're able to do so. <laughs> so um, thank you both very much and I'll now hand over to you. Thank you so much, Amanda Jay, and thank you to the AA for this opportunity to speak with Thomas J. Price, uh, who is a brilliant and remarkable maker of images and objects. Hello, Thomas. Uh, Hello, nice Michael. To be here with you. Good to see you again. And you. Uh, I'd like to start with a question uh, to get your sense of the difference between what we would call public art and art in the public realm. Oh, that's a good question. So, I don't think I've been asked that one like that before. Um, yeah, I, I think there's, there's a, certainly is a difference um, from from my perspective. In as much as you know, you can have works which just happen to be in a public space, which bear no relation to the the usage of that space, the the demographic of the area. Um, they're they're simply you know occupying a space outdoors. And then you can have work which takes into consideration what it means to place objects for consideration into the public and what is happening in society at that point, who the works will be seen by, uh, you know, et cetera. So I think there's, um, there is a, there is a, perhaps a subtle difference, but I think the, the effective uh, of the effect is quite significant. Thank you for that. I, I, I like that answer very much for many reasons. And, and for those of you who are joining, you will notice there's an image 
of uh, Thomas's most recent uh, work. It's called uh, Reaching Out, and it's in uh, East London near Stratford. Uh, it's nine feet tall, which you might not get a sense of from the image with the foliage around. Uh, and it's quite remarkable. And Thomas, if you would just talk a little bit about this work, how it came mm. about, and your thinking behind it. Yeah, well, I mean, so I've been working with figuration with the, the human form for quite some time. Um, but I, I came into it from uh, a very much a conceptual sort of abstract uh, way of working. Uh, I was really, or I have always been really kind of fascinated by the sort of the inner workings of our minds, the, the how the, the unconscious connects to the conscious, um, how things that we're not you know, necessarily aware of consciously affect our conscious actions. So our, how these inner spaces that we all exist in and, and carry with us actually have such an impact on the, the external and the, you know, the societies that we live in. Um, and for a long time, I was working with imagery around black men and what it meant to be, you know, a, a black body in space, a very specific kind of um, presence in space, given the real world reaction to black men in society. And it's, you know, not just in the UK, but in the States. And it seems like generally speaking in the Western, uh, Western world, there was this sort of a very particular way of, of, of being received. Um, so, you know, I, I was looking at art history in terms of, you know, who, who is represented uh, in statuary. So these are, you know, these are, these are sculptures. These are sculptures about statues. So these are, these are artworks about how society has chosen and decided to uh, represent physically um, the, you know, the, the, the good and the great, those who should be looked up to, you know, it's, it's like a reinforcement of, the visual kind of markers of power and that you know that's like a the visual <laughs> reinforcement of, of the structure of power and so my first efforts to kind of critique that was to first off actually to look at the scale so I started off making very small works which were the sort of they weren't an anti-monument they were just the sort of they were to highlight f via contrast um what it what it meant to be powerful what it meant to to carry power, to emit power, um, or to, to emit some you know, value and status, and at what what degree? So, um, the, the the first ones were it was a small head, and uh, and to critique the idea of portraiture. You know, so we've got monumentalism, statues, and then we have portraiture. On the other hand, you know, this idea of representing specific individuals who uh, warrant the sort of the high um, praise of a portrait or have the money to, to commission a portrait or, you know, society decides that they are amazing and need to be celebrated. And so they create these portraits. Well, I, I went about critiquing that by deciding to, to basically reject this idea of individuals, this idea of individual achievement, this idea of looking up, almost looking up the food chain to, to who we should value. And I, I made uh, fictional characters based around almost around, um, initially around feelings, around these kind of emotional structures, these emotional armatures, um, trying to recreate within the viewer specific um, emotional states. Um, and so I would use different physiognomies, different facial structures and, and very subtle gestures to try and elicit these responses from the viewers. And then it became a process of playing with the, the, the responses to those, you know, via shows, via um, criticism by write-ups, whatever it was, just comments if I was in a gallery space. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to like condense a lot here, but basically I started to, yeah, I was still using a smaller scale. So I've never worked on a life size kind of scale. Um, it, I've always wanted to keep the, the viewer conscious of this idea that it is a, an object you know, it's not a swap in, swap out kind of representation of a person, of an actual person. This is a, this is a sculpture. Um, this is about someone. It's not um, a substitution for someone. <clears throat> and so uh, I started to make figures who, who looked familiar to me. Um, they, they felt like people I would see around either where I lived or where my studio, studios have been. Um, and I was basically sculpting uh images of black men in contemporary clothing but with the same level of care and the same approach really as sort of neoclassical sculptures 
so I kind of looking beyond the ancient Greek and but looking to like the neoclassical who were trying to like replicate and so who had decided that these values were um, represented by Greek sculpture uh, and Roman sculpture and wanting to kind of you know instill that in their contemporary individuals so I've taken that and put it into my contemporary individuals who sort of um, refuse to take the stance of uh, the kind of the conqueror you know they refuse to take the, the puffed out chest the you know all these some things they they stand very relaxed as if as if the viewer is not there so it, it's a, it's a non-performative kind of sculpture in in the in the sense of their their poses um and i think that that is in if i can think of that yeah. oh sorry you I interrupted you. i'm sorry go ahead Tom. no 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 i was probably just I said, going off on a ramble if I, ask, if I could ask you a question on that because i think uh you know reaching out is an astonishing work for many many reasons subject matter the activities of the person, the imaginary person you are presenting to the world. The woman is looking at her cell phone, texting, getting information as uh, you have talked about. And she's in the world uh, in a way that is uh, not, not ordinary, quite remarkable, but at the same time, her everydayness tells us viewers uh, about perhaps the problematic of sculpture uh, in the historical context. And it's that piece that I think is so radical mm -hmm. about this work and about your practice generally. The non-performative depicted, which in fact evokes then a number of questions about ideology and contemporary culture. So I was struck uh, by the tension always within sculptural works between idealism and realism. And you can look at the history of sculpture across time from antiquity to the present. And artists have always grappled with how to show their subject matter. Add to that the fact that sculpture in the public domain has always been a tool of power. These are, these are artifacts of hegemony. And if one thinks about that, then in, in light of events that uh, Manager referenced, namely the taking down of the Colston statue, the news that we know from the United States around debates on uh, Confederate war heroes and whether they stay or they go, your work, and particularly uh, reaching out, represents a, a radical and emancipatory paradigmatic shift about the power of art to engage conversation and community, to use a phrase that you've used. So I'm wondering, do you see yourself as an ideological agent in your practice? <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I do this for a reason. I, I'm, there's certain strategies that I've employed um, throughout my whole practice, which to a point kind of involves keep myself separate from an acknowledgement, you know, direct acknowledgement of that or from, you know, I, I, I try to go a bit more obliquely into, into this discussion. Um, but certainly, you know, I have a, I have a stance on, on, most monuments, you know, a type of monument, a type of uh, monumental sculpture, um, which which is, you know, against what is currently there. And so the, the, these sculptures, these objects that I'm, I'm trying to place out into the public are purposefully the opposite to that. I mean, they, it's, it's interesting because, you know, these, these things are critiquing monumental, monumental statues. Um, and yet they are sometimes mistaken for actual monumental statues, you know, within the, so with the same ideology as, as those uh, conquering heroes, you know. So um, I, I find it interesting with that, that kind of, uh, I, wouldn't, I was about to call it misreading, but when, when the works are taken in that vein, because I, I think it shows just how strongly we have been sort of um, educated, um, conditioned, into you know, our expectations and also you know, into our value system. So I, I, I'm trying to make people aware of just you know, what, you know, what position we're in at the moment in terms of how we feel, how we feel about monumental sculpture. Because you know, as you've said, some of these sculptures have come down and what's the first thing that happens? You know, they wanna put up another sculpture of an actual person. 
Um, and I'm, I'm not against sculptures of actual people across the board. I, I, I'm just representing one idea or one methodology of, of thinking, which is about what, what, what if we looked beyond the individual? What if we right. try to talk about, you know, <sighs> characteristics or what if we just made ourselves, you know, awareness about um, a sensitivity to the worlds we inhabit and, and the people we interact with. And I think, you know, I, I was making this kind of sculpture long before statues started getting pulled down, before people were really looking at the statues. You know, obviously, there were, even with Edward Colston, you know, that was a contentious sculpture for a long time. You know, that's why it got pulled down. Um, but it was kind of like a smaller groups, wasn't it? And now it's, everyone seems to be looking around. You know, it's, it's, it's an amazing time because people seem to be very conscious and aware of the things around us. You know, these, these elements, these, these structural components to our society, to the, the, the places we live in and which give us the information about how we should think. So yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to change that. Absolutely. So then, uh... In light of that, and, I, and my question was perhaps a bit unfair to ask whether you were an ideological agent, because all art is ideological, but not all artists seek necessarily to offer some type of um, critique, political critique. Your work is about representation, and with that comes the potential implication of a position or a stance. And I'd like to move to that for a minute, but first I want to sort of acknowledge something about uh, reaching out. No plinth which is uh, such a remarkable decision uh, because of its, its implications and what it means. Most, most statues that get put up or pulled down uh, sit on these elevating structures. That's the first piece. Second piece, I'm always uh, interested in the tension between the word monument and then the word monumental. So one is about scale and the other is about commemoration. Yep. And I think uh, with your permission, I'd like to move to this question of commemoration because by making the choices not to represent actual people, you are taking not an ahistorical or anti-historical stance, uh, but you're inviting a type of collective reflection on society and the complex compositions that make society, as opposed to saying this event, this person, this way of recording. Am I wrong or is this part of your broad? No, no that's, that, that's, that's very good. I, I hope this is being recorded so I can, I can put that in a book. Um, no, that's, that's exactly what, what it is about. You know, it, it's, the, the sculptures stand on the same ground as the viewer because they are, you know, she, you know as someone described it, you know, she is reaching out. This sculpture is like, you know, reaching out. It's not looking down at the viewer. And, and I think yes. there's a very important dynamic, you know, difference in that, just that very simple, um, you know, way that this, the sculpture functions or the, uh, the practical nature of how it stands, how it is fixed to the same ground that we walk on. So it's not elevated by right. the plinth, um, you know, and plinths are, have for a long time been big talk in, you know, in, in the art world in terms of their functions and then out in society, out in, you know, where we, where we live, where we see them, they, they always go with something which says, this is high value and, and removed from, you know, to be looked up to, to be, and, and I want people to feel a connection because the scale with this work um, goes against the sort of the everyday nature of what she's doing and what she's wearing. Mm -hmm. And then you have that shift in scale as you approach this, this figure. You know, the, 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 the right. dynamic changes between the viewer who's seeing something far off, perhaps. And then as they approach this, this figure, the scale shifts. And, and, and I want people to be aware of that, that, that feeling, that sense of perception. Thank you. So with your permission, I'd like to read you something that uh, you wrote, came out of the Time magazine article uh, published June 17th, 2020, in the context and in the midst of Black Lives Matter protests globally, uh, questions of commemoration, collected history, contested history. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the audience, if you have not seen this interview that uh, Thomas gave to Time, I recommend it. It's a superb, uh, superb set of thoughts uh, that capture very, very important uh, issues in our society at the moment. You say, if we really want to engage with history, 
and utilize sculptures in public spaces. To do so, then there needs to be consultation with the public on a case-by-case -case basis. We need to get a sense of what people feel. You go on to say in, in very thoughtful, clear ways uh, that it's about education. Education in society sits at the basis for the promise or the potential or the absence of transformational change. The broad emancipatory project uh, for equality, anti-racism, the dismantling of white supremacy and all of those uh, attached pieces. Uh, and you, you talk about the UK and the way that uh, it remembers its past. And I'm wondering if we could spend some time on that subject, because in light of the recent US election, in light of uh, Prime Minister Johnson's vacating what I would call an ethical position uh, against racism, the whole proms debate, the sort of ambivalence, how do we as uh, concerned citizens who want the change that we can imagine, how do we do this in the context of public conversations about art? Oh, that's a big question. I mean, I think honesty is a good, a good place to start. You know, someone like Johnson, who uh, has, a, has a pretty poor track record when it comes to racial commentary. Um, you know, Piccaninnies and, and Watermelon Smiles, uh, which he then just laughs off and doesn't take seriously at all. Um, and other people laugh it off and, and also don't take it seriously because, you know, he's, he's enabled. He has people who make that okay. Um, so he's not held to account. So if we're not, you know, prepared to hold people to account, you know, Trump's administration around him, you know, they, they haven't held him to account. That's why he's being able to do what he's done. You know, I'm not a historian, you know, I'm, I'm an artist and I, I make no claim to having a, a huge knowledge of history, but I, I am conscious of, you know, the world around me and how people are wanting to maintain certain narratives because that is, that is so important to the, the, their identities and it's so important to their kind of essentially their level of comfort. And, um, and I think, you know, <laughs> I'm talking about levels of comfort and like, I, I'm used to not being comfortable, you know? I, <laughs> so I think there's this idea that this, that everyone should just feel comfortable. And, and I, I think particularly, if, if you're within a majority population you know, who have been in power, so particularly you know, straight white men, um, you're kind of used to feeling comfortable in most social situations. Okay, there are different um, personal situations that can, everyone feels, but generally speaking, you know, the, the world reflects, looks, you know, is made in your image. And so, you know, these statues like Churchill, which are protected by groups of men out, you know, standing up as if, as if they're going to be prime targets for, for these crazy left wingers, you know, these radical left as, as Trump would say. Um, I don't know. It, it kind of, it, it, it baffles me. Um, well, it doesn't baffle me. It, 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 I'm just tired basically of it. I'm tired. Um, I, I think we need to be willing to make real change. Like, again, you know, I don't use the word too much, but this performative element to what's happening at the moment or what has been happening, this idea that you can put a black box, this idea that you can like stuff put up on Instagram by black artists or black writers. Okay, that's fantastic. I mean, I don't know why it takes, you know, the deaths of many uh, black people to, to, for that to happen, but I, we, you know, if, if, if people generally want change, then things have to change and that's gonna involve people's lives also having at least a small little change, you know, at least having some sort of effect or knock on effect. Probably gone off so, you know, the, thank you for that. You know, the title of this conversation is a, a new model for public art. And, and it's a very nice phrase, uh, but within it is a very s complex set of relations, social relations. Really what we're talking about is a radical new model uh, for society, uh, a visionary way of creating community. Public art, your work, for example, uh, provokes, stimulates, encourages, uh, transforms people's ideas about selfhood, about society, history perhaps, but only some people. I mean, I'm reminded uh, in the wake of uh, Trump's loss, uh, Professor Eddie Gloud, Professor of African-American Studies at Princeton University asked the question, he said, it, it, it's good that Biden has won and that power now may shift towards uh, 
a more reform-minded uh, and inclusive model of governance and society. But he said, I am vexed to know what the 70 million people who voted for Trump actually thought they were supporting. And he went through a list. He said, clearly supporting white supremacy, misogyny, bigotry, homophobia, uh, mocking of the disabled. Ultimately, Glad said that these people are so vested in what they see as their position in society being challenged, if not eroded or stolen. And I think that that is centrally important to the premise of a new model for public art or the radical remaking of society, which I think your practice uh, raises as a possibility. And I'm wondering if we could talk about contested histories for a moment, because for every person who is transfixed and transformed by your work, there are other people who would say, don't take that road statue down and what they did to Colston was a crime. So yeah, they, they, they email me, trust me, I know they're there. <laughs> I, I, I get I get the messages. Um, absolutely. And, but really, it's who, who am I, you know, I, I'm trying to reach the people reaching out to the people who are willing to listen. And hopefully, the, you know, some of the people who are willing to listen are then willing to act. And, and hopefully some of those actions will then lead to, you know, uh, small changes and those changes, you know, exponentially it goes on. And that's, that's really as an individual artist, all I can really hope for, you know, tr trying to manage my expectations. Um, I'm not trying to uh, bludgeon someone into a different way of thinking via, you know, these large visual images of, of statues, sculptures. Um, I'm sort of, I'm trying to engage people who are willing to to engage and sometimes people who initially not over time change their minds and you know you know, it's kind of time on target this idea of have if you have enough contact with something um you get to consider it over a longer period of time um you know the, the, one of the things i wanted to do with the using um figuration particularly of black people and, and in the beginning particularly of black men was to make well, there's two twofold really. It was it was to make a wider society feel more familiar with that imagery, and to to in, and to encounter these images in spaces and places. So namely, at the beginning, it was art galleries where they felt safe, and where they could look at these images in a, in a sort of more contemplative way, and you know, the kind of um, as art objects, as high value, as all the things that are contained in, in gallery spaces. And then when I started to move it out of there into the public realm, it, it amped up the, um, the, the ante of it, basically. It was, you know, you're suddenly you're, you're, in, up, you're in someone's space. You know, this work is now in their realm. And they're going to take a much different uh, view on it. But some people who wouldn't have a view or who would never step into a gallery, suddenly they're seeing this thing. What is that thing doing in my world? Um, and why does it look like the things that I recognize? And why is it not doing the thing? Why is it not looking like the thing I expect to see and that I'm comfortable with? You know, and I, I'm, you know you've mentioned just then about people feeling comfortable or being invested in their own lives. You know, I mentioned it earlier. I think it, it, it always amazes me just how much emotion and how much um, passion, good or bad, um, uh, a kind of a deviation away from the, the expected can, can bring out in people particularly when it's something which is sort of in the public realm. Um, and something like, you know, the, the, the sculptures that I make, the, thing, the reason I'm smiling now is, is that they should be, they should be normal. They should be, you know, like, they're, they're, oh, wow, I wonder what they're thinking. Because I actually started making these from a humanistic kind of point of view when it was about the emotion, like I said earlier. Um, and for the, the first commission I, I, I had of one of these smaller figures, um, I'll shorten the story down massively, but essentially um, it was rejected at the very last minute because the commissioning body decided that the sculpture, which then turned into a nine foot version of a man holding a mobile phone network, that, that sculpture was deemed um, to be likely to be um, seen as a rioter by the press in the UK. And so therefore they couldn't, they couldn't show it. And, you know, but they never told me that directly. I got that from a different contact, but um you know, this is what I was dealing with. You know, these are the things that were like in the back of my head, you know, as, as a black man, as an artist, trying to make work about society, make work about perception, make work about what it means to try and connect with people about empathy. And 
and ultimately, you know, having confirmation that this imagery, which was actually based on myself, um, was seen as criminal. And um, yeah, I mean, that, you know, as a starting point. Criminal, criminal in the minds of people who have values that are often not considered. I mean, one of the things about the construction of the, the bottomless depths of Western racism and white supremacy is where cultural constructions, the determination of something becomes naturalized. And if we're talking about white supremacy, which I think is at the core of this conversation, uh, mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of years that have legitimated white power, white violence, genocide against people who don't look uh, like the conquerors uh, and those in positions of power on their equestrian statues in parks throughout the Western world. Yeah. And so to, to challenge people or to invite people to consider their subjectivity uh, often provokes remarkable outrage and anger. And I think we've seen that in the US election to go back to that with the supporters of Donald Trump who just are just beyond themselves at the thought that somehow they're being challenged or that their values are suspect. The people, the people who defend Robert E. Lee remaining in Richmond, Virginia, because of what he represents. And as we know, when you say to someone, well, what does that statue represent to you? People will say, well, history, tradition, all of those things. Hmm. And that's why I think your, go ahead. If I, were you gonna say something? Oh, Thomas? no, 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 I, sorry, it's probably, I just, I went, mm -hmm. so they probably jumped on me into the mic. No, yeah. I, 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 was, I was listening mm -hmm. intently. Well, so I think in, in, in that sense, you know, the idea of uh, a new model for public art, not to repeat myself, but to re-emphasize or emphasize again, the fact that what we're talking about is the possibility of a profound reconfiguration of values. And it comes back to my mind about your insightful comments around history, how history is taught. Uh, I was thinking uh, in, in looking so forward to talking with you about the work of uh, David Alasoga, who you know has uh, spoken about the construction of uh, British culture and British racism, and then about the investigations into the legacies, the economic benefits of uh, the enslavement of peoples to the British world, and the fact that thousands and thousands and thousands of ordinary people benefited uh, from the transatlantic slave trade, the enslavement of peoples, mm. so that they could have sugar in their tea and they could live lives of refinement. And as a historian, when I bring up these issues to people, what I'm often faced with is anger. It's like, who are you to say that to me? And how dare you challenge yeah. the past? Oh, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah. We've moved beyond that. Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. I, I'm always well, horrified and dismayed and intrigued uh, by the seeming incapacity and I actually think it's often incapacity as opposed to blatant unwillingness to think about the consequences of history and the means by which society could change itself. Your work, to my mind, is an invitation to that. And it's, it's the most empathic and wonderful invitation. And I think you, your strategies of not, not talking or showing specific people it's a, brilliant, it's a brilliant strategy for new public art. And so uh, maybe you have some thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, well, you say it very eloquently. Um, yeah, it, it is it's new strategies. So, I mean, I, I mentioned a bit earlier, you know, like the, the figures that I make, these, these abstract constructs, you know, which are aimed at trying to create a feeling within people and to make people aware of, what they normally see, you know, they, they they reject, as I said, you know, this this, this heroic, um, because I, you know, I don't want to. I'm not trying to say that. Um, okay, tear down all the sculptures of uh, slave owners, uh, of people who've you know uh, colonized and and crushed whole peoples, um, just to replace them with, I don't know, uh, black and brown people who have their own histories, you know which might be, we don't know exactly what the histories are. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's always gonna be some sort of problematic element somewhere. Um, 
I, I think, and by doing that, you know, by sort of my rejection of this, I, this that kind of normal hierarchy, it, it's sort of like rejecting the 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 kind of the tried and tested or the understood, you know, routes to to power or to success or to money. Yeah, you know, what people, you know, I think, and and that affects not just that's not talking about white people. That's just talking about people. Um, and, and I think you know when the Edward Colston statue came down and something else was put on. You know that for me fell into the trap of well there was many things that i had a problem with but that that fell into the trap of trying to use a single person as a representation for for everyone um like an actual person um and it just mimicked it was a mimicry of it might you know for me it had the sense of mimicry of uh, what had come down and it, it instilled the same values and the fact that it was made by someone who has benefited directly from those values and from those histories was the, the salt in the wound for me. And, and I think so on the, on the surface, absolutely powerful image, great. But, but it's, you know, walk along that path a little further and where do we get to? What are we, what are we then doing? We're just putting up the same, same things um, without looking at, you know, it's, it's, it's papering over the surface. So I, I want then to go back to uh, something you said in the Time magazine around the idea of talking to people and trying to get opinions and a consensus, perhaps, about w what type of um, objects, sculptures or objects, that would exist in the public realm and the subject matter. Well, absolutely. Easier said than done, because, uh, you know, I would say that we, we've seen a wave of populism sweep over the West and the non-West, in terms I don't like, but I'll use it. Uh, and you know, you think what's at the core of this groundswell of opposition to center-left radical change? Well, insecurity, anger, disorientation, whatever it might be. But by your account, if if there were a way of uh, finding out the opinions of people around what they would like as objects in space, sculpture. Mm -hmm. Mm. Could we talk about that? Because on the one hand, I think that beautifully utopian. Yeah. On the yeah, other hand, yeah. I think I, I I'm not really, you know I, I'm not as naive uh, to think that uh, we can go around and have a survey, um, get you know everyone can say the objects they want, uh, and then we create works in the public, which then you know make them manifest. I mean, I think really what I'm I was and what I am talking about is is listening to a wider sense of the the, the potential the, op the options that are available you know um instead of just simply going right so who who else famous who which famous black person can be put on the statue instead all right like i think there's absolutely a, a place for that um when these sculptures are, are being replaced <clears throat> when more come down i think they will come down um, but i also think that it's, it's incredibly important that we do use this as an opportunity to to make concrete to make physical this this uh the possibility the 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 intention <clears throat> into action of change of of looking at what we value do we value just you know individual achievements so like okay let's put uh, an athlete let's put this sports person you know like these all these normal routes to um to, to high status to value to acceptance and i think you know possibly when i'm talking about uh, black and brown people. I'm talking about acceptance, you know, in society, um, and there's, there's the, the the roots are often limited. Um, so I I think the, there is a debate to be had. It's, it's going to be quite messy. I think it's already a bit messy. Uh, people are you know people are going to be upset because, like I said earlier, these things, these objects, these sculptures, they 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 sort of are they've been distilled a lot of their all their feeling and their security and their identities into many of these objects like church or etc and it's i think it's always easier to maintain a status quo to maintain a situation you know, change is can be exciting but it's also very scary and if you you know there are people who feel like they're only just keeping their head above water so what where's their energy going to come from to to suddenly you know look at history again you know, there's, there's so many la layers to to people's resistance to change. Um, they may not feel able to. They may not feel that they've got the capacity to understand or to know or, or it's, oh, it's none of my business. Yeah. 
I guess what I'm saying with these representations of, of, of people that are nobody, but in some sense, everybody, is that we all have a responsibility. We all have a, a link to, to things that we might not, we might not necessarily identify, identify with initially, but there's, uh, a, there's a, a universality, without trying to get utopian again, to what it means to, you know, to be human. And there, there, there is the option to, to open our eyes and to, to really look at wh- where we are and, and what we've been doing. And um, sorry, Michael. I agree with that. I was thinking uh, in 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 what you were saying about the tension between uh, representation and the imaginarium, and and your work, as I as I've suggested, I think is inspired because it seeks a composite of people, and it's not one specific person; it's every person or every woman. And that's powerful. And I was also thinking at the same time, uh, if you know the, uh, the sculpture Rodney Leon, an American of Haitian descent, who was the designer of something called the Ark of the Return. Uh, it's a monument outside the UN in New York City that uh, pays homage uh, to the millions and millions of enslaved Africans in the Middle Passage. And uh, in talking about that work, Mr. Leon said that he had to make it abstract because to make it literal, uh, would be problematic for lots of reasons. And so it's this sort of angular geometric object. Yep. On the other side, I think of the work of the Danish artist, Jeanette Ellers, uh, and her uh, 2018 work, which was unveiled uh, in the center of Copenhagen, called I Am Queen Mary. And it's the first uh, sculptural representation of a black woman. And yep. uh, Mary Thomas, uh, who was uh, led a, a labor revolt in 1878, and were known as the Fireburn Riots. Lots of negative reaction in overwhelmingly white Denmark to having this piece of sculpture in a very prominent place depicting a black woman. Now, Ellers in her work didn't have an image of uh, Mary Thomas per se. And so it is a type of imaginary depiction, but it's an intensely political work in its yeah. form. And so we have these three sort of stages around uh, subject matter and the representation of complex and important themes. And I would say your work has found a, a very important spot around the raising of ideas, the inviting contemplation about history and contemporary society, and to use your word, the invitation to empathy born of empathy, yours, but the invitation to empathy. And if there's anything about a new model for public art, it's the capacity of empathy to change hearts and minds. And uh, yeah, I think that's very well put. Offer that up. Well, I don't there's anything more to say to that. I mean, I'll just start giving you a little clap. Um, that's, yeah, that's fantastically well put. Um, it, it's, as I said, it, it's trying to find almost that common ground with the undercurrent you know that kind of thing that can connect us all and draw us all into having a sense that it's, this is worth doing for a start you know I, I perhaps it's a lot of people just think well what's the point i don't know like um if you're, if you're trying to create inertia if you're trying to move someone from a position of you know stasis or, or rest or it, it takes a lot of energy and and you need them to be willing to, to, to come with you. And, and I guess a lot of my work has been trying to find ways, strategies to make people willing to start to move. So that is like references to classical sculpture. That's the, the level to which you know, they are rendered, made. Um, the, the, these kind of, you know, the, the sugaring of the pill to try and get people to swallow so that they can, you know, experience some sort of internal change. Um, so yeah, I mean, I love that. Yeah, the, the invitation to empathy is exactly what these are. Because if you can start to see these sculptures, these representations of imaginary people as human, as as the same, then that might create this willingness to to movement, you know, to move, you know, to, to create action in individuals. Or even if that is just the the cessation of resistance to change you know so the person themselves might not do anything but they might stop you know trying to hinder someone else from doing something 
they, they, you know, whether that's verbally, you know, mentally, um, you know, they, they, they might just be willing to, to see what happens initially and then, and then join in when they realize that it's not going to destroy their lives. <laughs> recognizing someone else's uh, value or recognizing someone else's um, as human or as, as complex as, as they are, you know? Um, so I think within these sculptures, I'm also trying to just on a humanist level, make us aware of the complexities of, that we all have. Um, and yeah, it's quite hard to not get utopian about this, isn't it? Um, you, you're, you're, you're a very with a gentle heart and, and you're a good person <laughs> in the way you phrased it. You know, I, I, uh, I think there has been an, a profound inability for white people in, in the West and in wherever white people go to confront the actions of whiteness against non-whiteness and the constructions of what are presumed to be legitimate and lawful and correct ideas about identity and relations, social relations, about power, about wealth. And as a result, I think the, the angry responses that we often see reveal the, the level of terror and insecurity that people feel when they think that the world they know and that they can't imagine not possessing could in fact change, yeah. should change, will change. The inevitability and, uh, of it. Th that, correct, mm. correct. Mm. Uh, it's, it's fair, it's fair. Any comment on any... I'm sorry, say again? Well, I said, do you have any comments you would like to make? Uh, I, I, I have other questions, but I think at oh, this point. No, 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 let's, let's, let's carry on. You... I, think, I think you've, that was, yeah. I think that was good. Well, I, I might offer one anecdote. Just so I'm, I'm in Vancouver, uh, Canada, uh, sitting uh, in a you know townhouse of a friend uh, on what's known as the unceded lands of the Musqueam Nation. So most Indigenous peoples in Canada did not negotiate treaties with the British government to cede land, but society that grew up in the colonial and national state exists on Indigenous territory still, but without any legal transfer. And I remember once I was uh, talking to some colleagues about the land acknowledgement. So in Canada, it's customary to say, welcome, we gather today on the unceded lands of the Musqueam Nation. And I had a colleague, white colleague, come up to me and he said, I am so sick and tired of these land acknowledgements. And I, and I said, you know, why are we doing this? And I say, well, it's very important to recognize the consequences of history. History itself, the consequences of history in the contemporary frame. And I said, the question, that I would have for you, this person who was quite pissed off at my land acknowledgement. I said, how do you account for your privilege? Mm. And he said, I work hard. And I said, okay, fine, you know, everybody, everybody works hard. And I said, but we're actually talking about deep, deep structures of history that have been managed, formed, regulated, defended, that have resulted in a world of profound inequity, violence, genocide, anger. And I said, so your privilege, you may think is simply because of the sweat on your brow, but in fact, it's about complicity. And I do think that we should all be mindful of our own complicity in A, the structures that perpetuate inequity and violence. And then we have to think about our own agency that can, and I hope will, bring on the profound uh, change that we, we seek as people. Back to the empathy. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, totally. I, I, you know, th th I've got many anecdotes where you know I've met people who think, it, as as your you know the person your story describes, it's all down to their hard work and their you know innate genius that they've they've got to where they are and they just you know whether it's economic, you know, oh my parents just happen to have and then you know they name so much, you know, kind of property and investments, uh, the ability to travel, the, you know, the access to things. Um, right. You know, society is not fair. You know, we're, we're kind of brought up thinking that it, you know, we've been told it is to, to an extent, you know, look at all our films and all the narratives, you know, this idea of the American dream for, you know, it's just, it's a nonsense. Um, I, it's, I don't know, but we, we got to... Well, Sorry, Karen. I'm going to go back to public art. I, I, I think I've told you the anecdote. Uh, 
when you had the Nomen Heads uh, in Regent Park, uh, and if the audience don't know this, you, your three remarkable large heads of black men at different ages on plinths, those are head sculptures on plinths. And I remember seeing a family, a uh, black family, and the little boy was pointing at one of the heads saying, look, mommy, it's me. Yeah. And that was a profoundly moving moment because as we have talked in, at other points in our friendship, uh, the idea of black representation in the public realm is phenomenally and problematically rare. It's, yeah. And that's why... I think there's an image in this slide deck. There's, a, there's an image where one of those, those heads that you talk about is being installed in Sculpture City here in London. And um, this, there's two families with their children and they, these kids just ran up to the piece that had just been installed and they were touching its face. And, the, and I think one of the, the young girls would be like, you know, there, there we are, or here we are, you know, well, it's, they saw it. And it, it, yeah. I went through art school in quite an isolated way. I was making work about the feelings I had, the sort of the, trying to almost deal with the experiences I was having you know, within school there, but also in society, you know, growing up. And I was making these works, not in a vacuum, but they were very much seated in art theory and in this kind of, you know, um, cerebral kind of thing. Uh, and it wasn't until I actually showed some works in, um, in New York in an art fair, I showed some uh, heads which are gold leafed and the, the part of the, the tech crews who were installing the whole fair came up and they were like, just again, there we are. Oh, this is, the, 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 you know, naming people feeling oh yeah feeling seen feeling present feeling you know part of a world where they've had to almost they got you got used to, you get used to functioning in in a in a, in a different way you know with, without without these without these feelings and i think once you experience it so when i saw this you know it was um it was quite special cuz i i didn't know that other people were going to get that you know, I didn't. I didn't realize how much it was missing from society, and um, and then you see that, and you're like, yeah, you know, this is the two it's guys. A wonderful, it's a wonderful. It's yeah. a it's a it's a wonderful. Uh, I'm reminded, and this will be closing. And I know we have some questions from the people uh, who are uh, present on this chat. Uh, I'm sort of reminded of uh, Shelley's poem Ozymandias. And uh, if, if people remember, written in, published in 1818, and it's about a traveler in some far eastern place, desert lands, uh, and he comes across the fragments of a, a monumental sculpture of some ruler who believed, probably at the time he commissioned his minions to make it, that he would endure and his power would endure and his regime would endure. And the traveler finds bits and pieces pieces of this broken monument to power uh, scattered. And I like to think that we should use that image that hegemonic white supremacist power and racist, racist regimes will one day, uh, their representations and perhaps their agents will lie scattered uh, in fields of lost dreams and it'll be for the betterment of the world. So thank you, Thomas, so much thank for you, that was brilliant. taking the time to your remarkable work. That's real pleasure. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, there, there is, a, I guess there are a few questions in the chat, but if anyone else has questions, please feel free to like raise your hand or post them in the chat so I can ask them on your behalf. But um, maybe to start, there's a question um, from Max Holloway who says that this is a fabulous commentary piece um, querying the critical perspective of power sculpt um, of power, and taking inspiration from what what you said, Tom, about sculptures, about statues, but isn't commissioned public space art actually part of that privilege process? And surely, granting physical site access is part of the power procedure. How do you think society can break those controlled networks? And is the art world ready to divorce itself from the corporate game? Mm, yeah. I mean, yes, it is. Um, but I think by opening up access to more people, to different types of people, is one way of, of creating a different structure. I mean, you get different voices, different experiences, um, different visions, opinions. You know, this, this is the way to, um, to at least try and um, round out 
what's happening to, to, to give more insight into the worlds that we live in, you know, into society, um, and more options to, in, in terms of how we represent it or, or, or what we draw attention to. Cause I think, you know, sculpture, particularly public sculpture is, it's quite elite. It's, you know, it's elitist because it takes money. You know, there's a lot of money involved in making something of a reasonable scale. If we're going to look at monumental as in terms of a scale, um, I, I don't believe that all outdoor sculpture has to be large, but, for, for the most part, it, it tends to be. So I think this is the issue I partly had with um, the replacement to Edward Colston that happened. It was it was sort of framed in a way where it was a big change and it was it was going to be um, so different to what had come before, but it was actually the same people making it, same people choosing it, making it, and profiting from it. And I think if we can open it up to new voices, to um, wider discussion, then I think there's a chance. Um, you know, I haven't got solutions. I've, I've got ways. I think you know ways of moving forward that I think will, will perhaps lead to different outcomes, um, but they're not going to be perfect. But you know, what is? Um, there's another question from the audience. I'll just unmute Castania. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for that. I wanted to ask you, like, what is your position on the temporality of a statue of a monument? Because, like, I believe that statues age as a piece of art more than as a sculpture. And when probably all of them were intended, like, to preserve certain memory or certain recognition to someone. And I believe that with time, I, like, that memory gets lost in the way. I mean, like we are right now, we are fa we are facing like many racial issues, but hopefully in a hundred years we won't have that. So, what will be like the role of these sculptors? Um, I, I, I've said before that I think almost all these individuals have kind of built-in sell-by dates in terms of you know things will things will change our our understanding, society's understanding changes. The object stays static, society for a good part kind of moves on and so yeah the, the original intention or the original uh, context for that individual changes and then it sort of it becomes steeped or molded by um uh, this sort of gradual process of building up legend or building up a story a narrative for what it is or attachments by certain people to objects um or to representations of people um and that's uh, that's why i try to resist making individuals actual you know literal representations of actual people that exist because i don't want to get tied up into this idea of the imagery or the excuse me the the public image the persona i guess of what these people are and how persona is used for political gains or ends um and it's often just as fictitious as as you know in fact more fictitious than the the, the characters i create because at least i start off acknowledging that they they don't actually exist, you know, in the, in the real world. Um, I think this idea of provenance, you know, this, if Ozymandias is, you know, this, if this, these fragments of a sculpture are pulled up from the ground one day, you know, people are going to give it an identity. They're going to say, this is who it is. And it's, it's probably going to be indicative of, or representative of the values that they have. You know, like when I was in Rome and they were, you know, I saw lots of these sort of sculptures, which have been almost like these Frankensteins pushed together. And the experts in air quotes, you know, had said, this is who it is. It's, it's, it's Mercury. And, you know, and you've got this huge torso, tiny head sort of, you know, <laughs> kind of filled on. Because we want to give definitive answers. We, 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 want, we like certainty. Um, so I, you know, I try to make my works that are figurative in a way that um, doesn't um, tether them to someone's actual history, but allows them to, to move with uh, how society moves. But, um, you know, I, 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 I don't know. It's an interesting question. Thank you. Unmute Rochelle and then um, Karen. One sec. Hello. Sorry, I tried to put my camera on, but it doesn't work. 
Um, mine was just a thank you, really, um, as a black woman. Um, when I saw your piece, Thomas, it, um, it was great to see myself um, for once represented. And I think as black people, um, it's only recently, obviously, after everything that's happened, that we have been allowed to speak and be heard in some way. And so to see representation is amazing, but it's also um, sort of highlights how much work has to be done, especially when you see the recent things of like people outraged at Sainsbury's doing an advert about black people yeah. and 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 the racism and the comments that have come out of that have just yep. been um <laughs> is, is it shocking? I don't know. Oh, I don't know if it's shocking at all. Yeah. It, it's just absolutely um it, it, people like to think that Britain don't have a problem with racism. Yeah. Um, we do. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and this kind of highlights it. Hi, sorry, we're still at work. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so it, it was just really a thanks. Um, we were introduced to you by one of our directors because um, you have a piece in our new office space in, uh, in White Collar Factory. Oh, uh, yeah. Um so Network. yeah. So um we we were introduced to you by him. Um and so yeah, I just wanted to say thanks really Thank for the representation because um it, it's needed. And for me personally, I didn't realise how much I was holding in until we were allowed to talk out loud. Um I didn't realise how much um I had navigated life and racism and not being seen so the minute we were allowed to be heard it mm. was like a all that oppression mm. sort of um yeah. burst open and I didn't understand at first why I was so emotional mm. about it because I just thought you know like I'm a woman in my 30s like it, I've managed to get through it and mm. and navigate it um but not speak about it and call it out for what it what it is yeah um and also accept not being seen um accept not being recognized um for the for anything in some mm. way so um yeah that was it really that was well, my piece uh, well, thank you I, yeah that's it's well thank you for for commenting um yeah i, I had the same moment when i you know i, I made the works and even until i put them into public space and saw other people's reactions I hadn't fully comprehended exactly what I was trying to do or, or on one level, what was really motivating me. And it's this idea, you know, like chronic stress, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the level of stress that you just get used to. You get used to living with it um, or like, you know, carrying this weight and then there's suddenly the weight's taken off your back by someone else, you know, suddenly exactly. wider society wants to like, like oh, that's the, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They'll take this for a little bit. You know, I'm worried about how long they want to take it for, but yeah. Um, <laughs> this is this, I think this is why it's so important for us to keep conversations going and for um, people like you to do this kind of thing this work is so important because it's it is the part of making a change and yet yeah, makes everybody feel quite uncomfortable white people in particular feel very uncomfortable but we've been in feeling uncomfortable our whole lives um and had yeah. to try and work out a way to um not let that get to us and yeah. um, build a resilience to feeling uncomfortable so yeah. yeah people don't like it at the moment but it it we have to encourage this kind of work to continue for people to realize that we're not going to be quiet again yeah um, I, I, I totally agree it's yeah it's this idea of being you know of, of always being our responsibility to be the ones who are uncomfortable and just learn how to deal with it just you know, yeah you know that is it sounds so small perhaps if you haven't experienced it but it's such a huge thing it's such a massive burden you've got to be hyper aware all the time or you've got to be you know consciously suppressing your own you know real emotions and expectations and there is the expectation that you do that yeah and and with these works you know this, this, when i first made um, some nude figures in 2008 i was told what are you you know what are you doing like uh, It'd be better. Why? How? Why are they nude? You know, and this is from <laughs> this is not just from white people. This is from black people as well. You we felt very vulnerable and exposed in these representations because they weren't necessarily used to seeing it in sculpture, at least. 
you know, I, I think of Barclay or Hendricks is beautiful paintings, but um, yeah, there, there is a level of being uncomfortable and when you, when you start to have to acknowledge things, but I think it's necessary. Absolutely. Thank you, Rochelle. That was yes, thank you, Rochelle. a really moving comment. Um, Karen, I'll just unmute you so you can ask your question. Okay. So, well, thanks very much, um, Michael um, and Thomas, for you know what has has been a very um, you know, engaging and enlightening um, conversation. I just wanted to ask if a few or make a few comments and ask a few questions around the sort of level of engagement, I suppose, around or the difference that you see, Thomas, between engaging with ideas of collective historical memory and cultural memory in relation to the work, because I think they're sort of like quite different things. Um, and also just in relation to how much you are consciously trying to engage with ideas, I suppose, of transnational um, histories. And I say that with thinking about Jeanette Ellis's work, um, what I think is sort of similar, but, but also unique about it. One, it's a 3D print, and so it's a very, it's a temporary, even though it's large scale, it's actually temporary. The Danish state hasn't commissioned it as a work that is going to be staying around for a long time, which yeah. I think is telling. I was going to say um, something, yeah. Um, equally, it's um, made um, it, it, with a collaboration with a somebody from the U.S. Virgin Islands, another artist from the U.S. Virgin Islands, which had been a colony of um, of Denmark. And actually, the visual representation is an amalgamation of their figures that they've scanned together to come up with a contemporary representation of um, of, of Mary Thomas. And so, I think. What I think is interesting about that process, but also the history. So, so what you're getting is a sort of like a sense of hidden histories. So Danish, lots of people in Denmark and, and me, you know, as a European, um, did, had no idea about the existence of this woman. So you've got an intervention into sort of like um, hidden histories, but you've also got an engagement with a classicism in relation to the formal representations because of where it sits in Denmark, which is actually alongside a very near a statue, a Michelangelo statue outside of, I can't remember the name of the building, and is of scale within that. But it's also using very sort of like very, very contemporary technology to actually deal with those representations. So you're dealing with the triangle of the slave trade, you're dealing with hidden histories, you're dealing with new technologies, and you're also dealing with, I suppose, that very um, concrete visualization of black womanhood that's not a no woman, it's very much somebody who has contributed to the historical presence of the two artists that are there. And I think that that sense of process and enlightenment and engagement on a historical level for me is quite you know not quite is very very exciting and I'm just sort of like wondering whether you feel that that sort of um, engagement could happen here in the UK um, and I'm thinking of the way in which um, is it the Mary Seacole statue that's at St Thomas's whatever that is you know there becomes a way in which if anyone can name a black woman it's Mary Seacole and it's a bit like oh have you heard of Mary Seacole <laughs> and so we have this this this, um, this uh, statue of Mary Seacole but you know there could be other people there could be other statues of both black uh, black men and black women and brown people around and it's just about how you Engage with the material, the materiality, and the historical. I think yes. at the same time, I'm wondering about what you think of that as a strategy. Yeah, I, I mean, long-winded. So no, no, I think that's fantastic. Um, I think the, the the work you're talking about, I I think is fantastic. I think the way it's been done is really amazing. I think the fact that it was made in a non-permanent material so that it could be removed was disgraceful, to be honest. Um, uh, yeah, I think the artist anyway. So dealing with, with things here, like I've said, I think there is there needs to be a mixed approach. So, you know, the stance I've often taken and have taken throughout this discussion has been more to the point of, or in the position of 
let's not get caught up in literal representations of historical figures because that's all we've had so far. And I'm trying to make people aware of the other value systems that we can engage with. So I, I think it's incredibly important that that is given a, a platform, um, you know, given uh, visibility and given uh, the, the the possibility, the, the potential to to be kind of move forward. Um, but I do believe, and this is why I talked about education, you know, in the, in the time article and also you know, Michael mentioned it here. I think education in terms of who our, histor- who our historical figures are, you know, the real histories, not just the histories that reinforce, again, you know, these, these power structures, these systems that benefit a few people uh, by subjugating many, many more others, you know, others. Um, I think it's really important that we, we have real education and, and some of the things that have been happening recently here in the UK in terms of potentially outlawing, you know, the teaching of certain elements of parts of black history are, are worrying to me if it's true. If that's, if that's the attitude taken by the government. Um, so yeah, I'm, you know, my own practice, I use, I use uh, very, you know, many different techniques. Sometimes I use scanning um, and compositing of individuals and with the Hackney um, commission that I'll be doing uh, that's, going to be uh, unveiled in 22 on Windrush Day, um, that will be using scans of um, people connected to the Windrush from Hackney, um, as well as, you know, then taken through my normal studio process to to create, you know, a piece or two pieces, which which for me kind of bring together, you know, the discoveries I make by meeting a lot of these people and by looking at the, the archives that, the Windrush archives that Hackney has. So absolutely, I totally agree with you um, that, you know, that is an approach that is, I think, you know, very uh, powerful and effective. Um, I try and utilize it myself to some degree. Um, and so I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm not resistant to representations of historical people, absolutely. But I'm trying to make clear how important I think it is to also engage with and value another way of looking. Um, maybe I, I have a question to add on to that, which is, um, I, I guess, like, how much has writing always shaped your practice? Because obviously you're making work in the public realm, but I think especially recently you've been writing a lot about how do you take some of the things you've been thinking about in your work and and talk yeah. about it applied to the wider discipline um, yeah. with the social issues. And I was wondering whether that was something that always kind of helped you shape your thoughts and and practice or if that's something that's developed out of um creating work and the reactions to it and all these other things that have in, enforced um like kind of your opinions that you, that you've been talking about yeah i no i i certainly haven't come from a writing background um it it's interesting that you know if you write about something then it becomes more official and then people take it more seriously uh, and it also has many more kind of avenues to go down in terms of being disseminated into population and, and people seem better able to digest and um, process the information and then yeah, carry it on and, and discuss it. Um, Cause it, it's being sort of, you know, the ideas within the work or the, the values that I have been sort of laid out in a simpler form. You know, the reason I make artworks is because I like to kind of distill lots of complex ideas which just kind of uh sort of ephemeral they sort of like you know they they, they wafted and out of of um realize that you know uh, comprehension um and writing in the way that i have done is a bit clearer um and it's certainly you know with more recent events it's certainly something that i was asked to do uh in order to reach an audience um who wanted more, I guess, explanation. So art doesn't necessarily try to explain. I think with the writing that I do, it's more explanation and clarification. And something that's something I normally try and stay away from, to be honest, you know, like it's almost how to, how to remove the potency from a piece of work is ex- explain it all away. You know, I always talk about the ambiguity in my works because that's a way to, you know, to make sure that the person, the viewer what, seeing that work, they, they insert their own, potency of that they, they insert the, their own meaning that, that last part you know it's why the the eyes of my sculptures the figurative pieces are often hollowed out it's because it's it's invitation for the the, the, the person's psyche mentality or whatever to to fill that 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 
internal space of the sculpture, give it meaning. Um, so with the writing, it's very much more like having to be concise and ordered and, um, and to lay it out there in a way that can be critiqued in a, in a different format. So I, I actually, I enjoy it, um, but you know, I, I haven't done that much. And you know, maybe, maybe there's more to come, I don't know. Um, a lot of late nights, I'm not so good. I'm very dyslexic, um, but uh, I, I do enjoy it because I think it actually helps me order my thoughts, which then sort of prepares me for um, the studio. Um, I, I think mostly in terms of studios, I like, you know, I like things that freshen up my ideas and, and, and help me make new work. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't come from a writing background. No, I just thought it was really interesting in terms of expanding your practice. Like, um, obviously, the work is one part of it, but the writing kind of frames it within a larger context of, of issues that have been going on. And as you say, like questions that a lot of people kind of want answers to or or the beginning of um, understanding kind of where they yeah. come from. Well, I was, yeah, I was just trying to, you know, I was just starting to try and uh, nurture the image of a mysterious artist, but now I start to write. So, um sort of revealing a lot more than I had intended at the beginning, I think of, you know, of my career. But um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know what, I've, I've really realized the value in it and the, the power in, in the written words and, and the, the, the places it can carry thoughts and messages and the way it can engage with people. And I, I see it as working in tandem with um, the, the artworks, you know, um, and I think to be able to express oneself uh, personally is, is really important. Um, you know, it's saying that though, you know, I've really enjoyed, you know, this discussion with, with Michael kind of adding his insight into the work and the way that he phrases things is, you know, amazing. Um, but yeah, I think to be able to express oneself is obviously, you know, important. And I think writing may well become a more important, uh, component than what I do. Great. Well, um, I'm conscious of time, but Michael, I didn't know whether you had any final questions for Tom before we wrap up. Uh, well, I, I have one. I, I would like to say thank you to uh, Karen Alexander for, uh, for bringing the factual knowledge about I Am Mary, a, a very valuable for, for I think everyone, especially me, to have that. So thank you, Karen. Uh, and I thought Tom's response uh, valuable. I mean, I would, I would Ask the question uh, based on a, a quotation from Tommy. Public sculptures and statues have been used to signpost, to exemplify what power looks like, and to maintain the systems of power. And I think then, if we go to reaching out and the other works in Thomas's sculptural practice, and consider what he says about the traditional role of sculpture and uh, the capacity of his mode of making, as uh, an invitation to social reconfiguration. Uh, there's something very powerful in that. So my last question uh, to Tom would be, how do you see this ongoing question within British society and US and Canada around art as a medium for social dialogue and public art being more, more particular as a mechanism for social dialogue? Uh, in light of what are the profound contested ideologies of the West at the moment that seem to be increasingly exacerbated because of um, the urgency probably yeah. felt by both sides yeah. uh, around uh, a future that uh, is complicated and not assured. Yeah, yeah totally. Uh, you know, art is, is, is one one tool in the, in the, in the, in the toolbox, you know, for, for society to, to change or to make changes, make people aware. So I, I'm not sitting here thinking that art by itself is going to change everything. And, you know, but I think at the moment, it seems to be, people seem to be increasingly aware of its power, you know, the, the power of representation through physical objects, through statues, particularly at the moment has been recognized, you know, I've, I've been trying to talk about it for a while, but people, you know, are really recognizing it in their, in their lived lives and in their, in their daily experiences. Um, and I, I think that's going to continue for a while now. You know, I, 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 I think it's hard to, to walk back from that. Um, there, there will probably be a bit of a plateau, but I think if, if society, if, if here in the UK, if we are really, you know, the, the, 
the mayor's uh, inquiry into public sculptures. You know, with, if there's other inquiries into sculptures, you know, investigations or, you know, people looking to see what can be done and then the, the action is taken, then the new works that come through, they will rejuvenate, they will renew that power and the, well, hopefully they will renew the power of, and the, and the recognition, recognition of how these works can function in a way to, to, to help maintain change, you know, to, to keep the momentum going. Um, I think if we just have some sort of um, uh, inquiries which have findings and then those findings sit on desks whilst funding is kind of looked for but not really found, you know, we're doing our best, we're still, you know, it's allowed to die out, then, you know, that would be, uh, you know, really, I think that would be setting us back. That would be, you know, that, that's, my, that's one of my worries is that, you know, for the moment people are kind of interested um but when it comes to it when it comes to actually making real change do they do they have that energy left do they have that uh, willingness the motivation um uh, and the courage to to make to put these things into action um really important comment no really important comment i mean you know the 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 urgency and the immediacy of the global demonstrations against uh police violence against black people about supreme white supremacy all of that haven't gone away but there's been a, a fading and yeah. you know i you you worry that well you I, just, I i worry that anyway i, I worry that we're gonna there's gonna be like a little sort of a payoff almost like okay just give a few of these a few of these little things if you, okay you get two sculptures now and then you get to point to those two sculptures forever and go well, what do you mean we've got diversity you know it's like right. Like the workplace that has like one black person, they go, we're diverse. And then, you know, bring out the, the, the you know, and the, put to the front of the picture, you know, the, the photo for the office or something. So I, I think that's why, you know, I think Rochelle said it, that we, we can't go back. We can't let it get swept back under the table. We can't, you know, we can't just take the deal. You've got to be part of making the deal. You've got to be part of constructing what that deal looks like not just accepting what is put in front of you. And I think that's what I've been trying to do with my sculptures to not accept what's put in front of me, but to actually say, look, this is, this is what I believe. And this is what I want and try and push towards some change. Thank you, Thomas. I think that's a good, um, I guess, motivational note to, to end on <laughs> the hope that, in the hope that that's, that's what happens and not, um, I guess, the, the alternative, which is that this is just temporary. Yeah. Uh, I just want to thank you both for a really terrific conversation. I mean, I could have listened to it for another, I guess, 24 hours. <laughs> if cool, but, um, uh, I, I hope that um, it's, I, I think from all the questions and stuff, I think everyone has really enjoyed it as well. And um, because we're stuck in this weird kind of virtual space, I'm going to try and do a mass unmute so that you can get a round of applause. <laughs> um, we'll see if that works. But thank you both so much. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you.